All right, we've got economics reporter for The Washington Post, our great friend Jeff Stein is here with a big scoop this morning too. Great to see you, Jeff. Good to see you, sir. Thank you guys so much for having me back on. So you got some great insight into what exactly happened um, with regards to the eviction moratorium, how Biden, I mean, this was a complete flip-flop and turnabout. So what were those conversations like behind the scenes? Yeah, so I know um, your audience, you know, they're not that interested in substance. They just want to know <laughs> who's up, who's just down. Know the, horse race. Yeah. the Washington insider. What's going yeah. on with Mr. Potato Head? Who was exactly. spotted most recently at the Who was spotted where? Party. You, you can't get that kind of stuff from mm-hmm. Morning Joe. Mm-hmm. You will get that here. Mm-hmm. On Breaking. That's our yeah, core. That's right. yeah. That is our core offering. So I can, you I can give you the inside scoop inside okay. the White House. <laughs> All right, tell us. And what happened essentially is that as pressure grew, from Representative Cory Bush and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on the eviction moratorium. You guys did a great job of covering that last week. The the White House and President Biden in particular designated his chief of staff, Ron Klain, to find an alternative legal basis for extending the ban. Mm. The White House legal counsel had come up with an opinion that Biden had accepted that said that you did not have the authority to do this. Got it. And what, what is the timeline on all? When did that opinion come out? And then when did he say, hey, Clayne, you got to figure this out? I'm not sure precisely when she came up with the opinion. I know that by the week before the moratorium extended, there was a private White House meeting and discussions. Gene Sperling, Brian Deese, and Susan Rice were all involved in a discussion to say, hey, is there something we can do to get this going? Mm-hmm. And the White House counsel office said no. By the weekend, Ron Klain and President Biden are talking about well, what's going? What can we do here? Pelosi is adamant that this is the administration's responsibility, and they have to figure out how to do it. So, what happened was Ron Klain called Lawrence Tribe, who's a Harvard professor, and yep. said, "Is there any alternative explanation?" Tribe comes up with a defense, basically, which we can get into in a second. But <laughs> it, it says essentially, if we do a targeted moratorium for places where they're dealing with COVID, you know, very significantly, that is separate from what the Supreme Court warned against and mm. therefore valid. Mm-hmm. Mm. And Tribe also worked extensively with the White House Counsel's Office. They come up with a justification. White House Counsel's Office changes its mind, gets behind that, and by I think it's Tuesday, they're out. They're yeah. they're they're yeah. on board. So that's interesting. So basically, he had accepted this guidance. Then, okay, so talk about the public pressure then. Like, what were the levers and what were the arguments being made? Obviously, Cory Bush is on TV. People like us are covering it. A lot of other people are covering it. But then also you have Nancy Pelosi, who's in this bind. Maybe you could talk a bit about that, which is that, I mean, as Rokana said on our show, the truth is, like, some Democrats in the caucus did not want to extend this moratorium. So, like, what was she doing behind the scenes Mm. here? I mean, the the White House sources I've talked to have said primarily that your segment was what moved the needle here. Oh, Absolutely. right, of course. Yeah, yeah. That's what I figured. but beyond breaking points, <laughs> um, Pelosi spent the weekend in conversations with senior White House officials. She called Clayne, Steve Reschetti, one of the president's closest aides, mm-hmm. and it's my understanding that she spoke to the president three separate times after um, the president kicked the ball to Congress and before the new moratorium was announced. I think, you know, this is obviously um, the potential for a human tragedy was immense, um, and, and in many cases still is. But there's also the political ramifications of the White House dealing with headlines about in the middle of a pandemic in many states, Missouri, you know, Georgia, yep. you know, Arizona. Mm-hmm. Oh, are those important? <laughs> potentially uh, yeah, yeah, important yeah. states with millions of people <laughs> at risk of losing their homes. And I think this is kind of the fundamental tension that the White House is currently wrestling with. They are trying to project that the economy is coming back, that this is a time to, you know, and that, you know, especially before the Delta, that they, they wanted to put, you know, present an, er, an aura of economic normalcy. Mm-hmm. But the pandemic era government protections are beginning to expire. And though there's a conflict there, how do we present our economy as rebounding, as us moving beyond the pandemic without letting, you know, while, you know, keeping these, these extraordinary government measures in place? Mm. So I think that was what they were wrestling with. And I, you know, I don't know personally, I have people in the White House who told me that Biden was always open to extending it, but just was constrained by counsel's office. I think that many of your listeners will yeah. be skeptical of that explanation. <laughs> I think we should be skeptical I'm as well. I'm skeptical yeah. of that, yeah. Um, well, I do want to ask though, because part of what is so perplexing here is the timing, because it wasn't a mystery that you know the Supreme Court had ruled in this way. It was not a mystery that the funds that were allocated were not actually getting in the hands of tenants to make them home. It wasn't a mystery that the state was the deadline for the eviction moratorium, and yet no one acted until the very last minute. So 
focusing, I guess, I- I'd like to know both from Biden and Pelosi, Biden gets whatever this uh, decision is from counsel that says, hey, you can't do it. But he doesn't say anything about it till the end of last week when the moratorium is about to expire. When we talked to Congressman Khanna, he his impression or what he said to us is that there was an expectation from Pelosi and others in the House that the CDC was going to do some kind of an eviction moratorium and that they truly were sort of caught off guard that that didn't happen. On the other hand, the Supreme Court ruling is pretty clear. Congress has got to do something if you want this to be extended. And the House also didn't move to do anything whatsoever. So why was why did this come down to the last minute to the point where, as your paper was covering, you know, the evictions did go forward. I think in, we have it here. During the lapse. Yeah. Um, there was, you know, there were a few days there where people were kicked out of their homes and left in this terrible limbo where they have no idea whether they're going to be there or not. So how did it come down to the last minute like that? I think your s- summary there is excellent and captures really well exactly that this what, what, what you just said, that this was a fiasco and that they're really, it's very hard to understand exactly why the White House, even if they concluded, as you said, that there was no legal justification, on what possible basis can they defend waiting until two days before the moratorium lapses to inform Congress? Senator Dick Durbin, the number two ranking Senate Democrat, told reporters that um, someone dropped the ball, which is, you know, it sounds like a very meek right. quote in a lot of ways, but for a member of Senate Democratic leadership to actively assert that is, is, a, is a really big deal and a sign of the amount of dysfunction there was here. I think, you know, some people I talked to in the White House have said, Look, we we were caught flat-footed by the Delta variant. Like we did not, we mm. saw the economy reopening, and we mm. felt that things were headed in the right direction. There were some positive GDP numbers, there were some positive jobs numbers. The vaccination campaign is going well. Then I think there was this mistaken belief that, insofar as Delta would be a problem, it would be localized. It would be, you know, concentrated in the regions where. Um, you know, vaccination rates are lowest, which is partially true, but um, the extent to which Delta is still a problem beyond that is really striking. And, you know, I talked to one senior administration official who I quoted in a Washington Post report saying, like, what are we doing here, guys? Like, why is this taking so long? Mm. Um, and I remember you were covering this weeks before it even happened. Yeah. And then I kept being like, are they going to do anything? Are they going to do anything? And it's just nothing happened. It was really yeah. extraordinary. And then for them to be like, we're doing all we can when we were asking them about this weeks and weeks ago, and mm-hmm. they had no explanation. I mean, I think to to the credit, I mean, maybe to try to explain what they're thinking a little bit more is they think that the core problem, and I think they're right about this, the core problem is that the rental relief money is not getting out. Yeah. And even the most left-leaning housing advocates I talk to say, Treasury and Yellen are doing really everything within their power, within the confines. I thought you had a really good point on the last podcast about, mm. uh, Crystal pointed out that like this could have been done by the federal government. Yeah. And instead they ran it through the states. Right. Which was, I, th- I think many people would say was a mistake. But within that construct, Yellen in particular has been very aggressive in saying, states and cities push out this money to poor people and we will not, as treasuries have done in the past, hit you with a punitive audit. Like they mm. are... They are laser focused Mm. on getting this money out. And I think they're right that that is the fundamental issue here and that you can extend the moratorium for another three years. But if people are not able to pay the back rent that they've accumulated over months and months and months, I mean, I know the the left doesn't like it when you say this, but a lot of landlords who are not giant corporations are going to go out of business. A lot of— And then BlackRock is going to buy up those properties, and that's not great from a left perspective either. Right. It's it's stupid to erase that. The vast majority of landlords in America are small landlords. And I'm not saying these are like, you know, the paragons of society or whatever, but like they're middle class in many respects. It's it's, it's just a shitty situation. Right, exactly. It's like, look, you can't have this, especially in a property-owning society, which I want for everybody. And I think, you know, you shouldn't, you know, downplay that. Yeah. yeah. I, I do want to know more about how, how and why that program failed, because I do think, look, on the one hand, you got to, you know, say these states and localities have done a poor job in many instances of being able to get this money out. But you also have to say, when you see this is basically failure across the board, there clearly was a flaw in the way that the program was set up. Why are these localities having so much trouble being able to disperse these funds in a way that would help to alleviate the crisis? So that's a great question. And I, I think the, just to give a little bit of background, Congress has approved $46 billion in rental assistance. 
from my understanding, I think it's like about $3 billion has mm -hmm. been spent, and there's more than 25, you know, that estimates vary, but more than $25 billion in back payments. That is really not enough money for the need. The core of the issue, as I understand it, is basically that states and cities are used to and have gotten dinged for not doing this, but they are saying what we need is documentation and proof from the, from the landlord and from the tenant of, you know, when did you lose your job? Can you provide proof that you lost your job? Mm. Can you provide proof of an income hit? Can you provide proof of the hardship that you've undergone? Mm. Oh, so you, gotta, you have a mountain of paper. A lot of people don't yeah, have right. that. And not only do people not have that, the states and cities often, you know, rink, dink, you know like little cities right, that right, don't right. have a ton of staff. Some of them are trying to hire temp workers at the last minute, but that's like, that's a very yeah, hard lift. Work. So there's, the states and cities are looking at this program and saying, in the past, we've given out money that we thought we were being responsible about. And then the next year, um, the federal government will say, hey, why didn't this money get to the people who deserved it? You gave it to person X incorrectly. Mm -hmm. We're going to fine you. And so people who run state treasuries and city treasuries are understandably like hypersensitive about that happening to them. So they are, even though treasury, the current treasury is trying to say, go, spend the money, go, spend the money. Yeah. They're still insisting on a lot of these documentation requirements that make it very, very hard for low-income people to meet. Um, I was just talking to a really ex excellent housing expert, Paul Williams, at uh, uh, the Jane Family Institute, and he was making the point that Yellen has even said to these states and cities that they can just look at the median income within a certain, I, I don't remember municipality or what the, the exact designation is, and push out the money on that basis. Huh. Oh, interesting. That's, that's like a, uh, you know, 10 years ago, like in the height of deficit hysteria, mm. that would be an unbelievable political scandal, right? Right. But, right, right? but Yellen is, I think, to a lot of the housing experts, um, Joy, like, is actually just saying, like, just go spend the money and we will not come back for it and hit you for it later. And they don't believe her. Mm. Mm. So err on the side of getting the money out rather than being like, we must not have any waste, fraud, or abuse. Which and is I understand, very different. Right, yeah. and, but then you have, you know, like— I, I get it. I get the hesitancy because reporters and people in the media like myself will then write stories like, mm -hmm. all the money was misspent. Here's the grifter who got the millions or whatever. Exactly. Yeah. I remember seeing that about, it's like, dead people got X million dollars. I was like, guys, it's a trillion dollar bill. You're talking about like 0.01% of the bill. This you know is who all also bad. gets Social Security? <laughs> yeah, that's- Dead people. Yeah. It's <laughs> always such an annoying scandal. So then- Let's talk, and I think we have a Washington Post story, so if we can put that on the screen, just about what exactly the is being covered here in terms of 80% of the population. So I also saw reports of 90% of the it's population. It's a little confusing, my understanding. So 80%, 90%, what is actually being covered here? Well, let's, let's explain that, I think, a little bit to the audience because people will say, oh, you know, the Biden administration obviously using the most expansive definition. So 80% are covered for how long? What are the legal ramifications? Does the White House expect to lose in court? If so, like how soon? What, what are these guys thinking? Um, so I don't remember the precise uh, categories, but if, it's a, if the community spread of COVID is above a certain level okay. in that community, right. um, the 80-90 thing is a little confusing. I had that confusion too. Right. Essentially, it's 80% of counties will be covered, but within that 80% of counties, it's 90% of the population. Okay, got it. Um, what was your other question about about what they're thinking? In, yeah, in, in terms, terms of the legal the ramifications. Oh, and yeah. the legal, what well, they, so there's two things I want to say on the legal ramifications. One, there's a very interesting section of, of the um, moratorium that includes over a year of jail time for a landlord who knowingly um, yes, violates that, right. the rule, which is a very mm. big deal. Whoa. Um, and it will be very interesting, especially if any landlords initiated legal proceedings before this was in place, will people mm. try to mm -hmm. say after the fact. We know that the Realtors Association filed a lawsuit last night to stop this, but some of, I, I'm, a, I'm a little out of my depth on, on what is gonna happen in the courts here, but my understanding is it could be weeks before they take this up, oh, okay. um, which could be a huge deal. I think mm. the the hope is that they don't take this up till October. That's sort of when the court is going to be back, I think. Right. And so the expectation is 
that's why they extended the moratorium until October 3rd under the new guidance. Mm. Uh, because that's when the court comes back. That gotcha. makes sense. Um, so it's not just the eviction moratorium that is set to end in terms of pandemic relief. You've got also mortgage forbearance. You've got student loan debt forbearance. You have expanded SNAP program. You have um, unemployment insurance. This is another thing you've been really push- pushing and pointing out is the fact that 20 million people are set to lose unemployment. Thanks for watching, guys. We really appreciate it. If you want to see that full interview, you can become a premium subscriber today. The link is down there in the description. We give two exclusive long-form interviews a month to our awesome premium subscribers. In addition, you guys get the show a full time, or you get it an hour early, you get to listen to it, all of that, and we really appreciate your support. Quick side note, I'm going to be on vacation next week. The amazing Kyle Kalinske will be sitting in, KKF taking over the set here. <laughs> I'm very excited for that. I'll He's be in excited beautiful, about it too, actually. I, I hope he is. I'll be in beautiful Paris, France. So if you're uh, French and you're a breaker, hit me up. Let me know. Look um, at this and global I'll see elite there. over here That's flying true. to Paris, oh, France. I, <laughs> I need to get the hell out of the country. It's been a long time. You know? um, we love you guys so much. Uh, little known secret. When you're a premium subscriber, sometimes you get it more than an hour early. That's true. Especially thanks hour and a half to early. the new fancy computer. new computer yeah. that we got. Thanks to you guys supporting us so much. So, listen, we love you guys. We're going to have some more great content for you over the weekend. Enjoy the weekend, and I will see you back here next week. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. That's right. Just as a reminder, you can become a premium subscriber today. Watch the full show completely uncut. Our reactions to each other's monologues. You get to listen to it. You get to ask us questions. All that good stuff. Link is right there in the description or at breakingpoints.com. Best of all, great way to say screw you to the mainstream media.